Hi, I'm Mayor Frank Jackson. You've probably seen media coverage of the growing opioid epidemic in Northeast Ohio. But what you might not know is how many of these tragedies begin with a seemingly innocent prescription for pain medication. That is why we're teaming with the Cuyahoga County Opiate Marketing Task Force to encourage you to know the risk. Go to the website on your screen to learn which pills are opiates and alternative ways of dealing with pain. Which starts as a prescription can end with addiction, so know the risk. I understand. I know it's not your typical resume. Okay, well. But candidate. But I've been working double shifts just to pay for books. I've been raising my two little brothers. I'm determined, driven, motivated. Isn't that what you're looking for? Look beyond the resume and discover new ways to develop great talent at gradsoflife.org. Being prepared is a part of who you are, but it's especially important in the case of a disaster. Be informed about possible emergencies in your area. Make a plan that covers where you'll go in an emergency. Build a kit with the things you need to survive. There's no one more capable of planning for your situation than you. Start your plan today. Go to ready.gov slash my plan. me also yes if, if you were here last night you know we've done this before but so we're, <laughs> we're gonna try and do a slightly abbreviated edition of the of something when we did that five or six years ago I think the, the thing that they used last night uh, tell me how how we can fill the room at $150 a plate <laughs> <laughs> And when it's free, nobody comes. <laughs> maybe people are just waking up from last night, or maybe it's the Browns. Uh, I've known George just short of 48 years, a very long time. And if they say that we stand on the shoulders of, of those who came before us, and with everyone, there's an element of truth in that. But if, if you, as I've come to know George over the years, I've known that with, in George's case, that is ex especially true uh, because of where he came from and it shaped his view on life that continues to this day. And so I wanted to begin with asking you to talk a little bit about your childhood in Memphis and your fa and your father and your mother and your siblings. Well, I was I was born I was the there was nine of us really it was nine of us and I had a I had a, a younger sister and she was born in 1935 and she died of those childhood illnesses back then. I don't know whether it was diphtheria, whooping cough, whatever it was and. And then I was left eight, but it was eight of us, uh, and very poor. My father worked at a at a place called the Buckeye Cotton Oil Company, and that was a subsidiary of of Procter and Gamble. And my father got his arm cut off when I was a kid, and. It had his, it was his right arm, and they didn't. You didn't have workers' compensation, so they guaranteed him a job for the rest of his life. But my father also was a man who believed in farming, and we had to we had to pick and chop cotton. We picked and chop cotton uh, in Memphis. We 
picked and shot cotton in Arkansas, and we picked cotton in Missouri. Picked cotton in, in, in Missouri, a place called Portisville. And Roman, Ramona, Ramona Robinson was, was from that little town. And Portisville was next to a place called Sykeston, Missouri. And I remember they, they'd lynch a young black kid in Sykeston and drug him behind a car. But we had to go and pick cotton, chop cotton. I, I, uh, I didn't want to do that. And my mother didn't want us to do that. So as we, as we got older and went to school, she encouraged that we would, we would leave Memphis. My oldest sister left Memphis the first time, and she went to Chicago to live with my, my aunt, my aunt Mary. And then my brother Mike left, and he went to Chicago. And as we got older, finished school, we left Memphis. I came to Cleveland to, with my brother Z. Z came to Cleveland, I think, in 47 or something like that. And I, when I finished school, I came here in 1948. I came here in 1948. And then I came and I went to Chicago in 1949, but then I came back to Cleveland in 1949. I wanted to go to school at Bowen Wallace. So I went out and enrolled. Didn't have a dime. <laughs> Not a dime. But at that time, this 1951, uh, I got called, drafted. I went to the Marine Corps for two years. And when I got out of the Marine Corps in 1953, I came back to Cleveland, enrolled at Bowen Wallace. That's, that's about what happened. Memphis was, Memphis was a tough, tough place. Uh, I, I met a man here, he's here now from Memphis. It was, it was not a not good place for black folks. Nowhere in the South was, but that's, that's kind of who I am and where I come from. And, and, and so you went to school here and you eventually got a law degree here and you had, you, I think you worked as a postal carrier. And, and, and sometime in around the mid 1960s, you took an interest in politics. Can you talk about what got you in to this profession that became such a large part of your life? Can you, I want you to hold that question because I, I, I alluded last night to my grandfather, but I want to okay. speak about my grandfather. And my grandfather was the patriarch in our family. My grandfather and my grandmother lived across the street from us. They lived at 1308 Austin. We lived at 1315. And my grandfather taught us, the, the boys in the family, to be men. And, and he was born a slave. He was born in 1865. And there was, my mother had four sisters. My mother was, was extremely dark. My Aunt Georgia was, was probably my complexion. I had my Aunt Rosie and my Aunt Mary, and they, they were your complexion. And I could never figure that out. And it was in later years that my sisters told me, this, I was living in Cleveland, that my grandfather, my grandfather had to share his bed and my grandmother with the plantation owners, okay? He's born in 1865, he's born a slave. And you could see the, as I look back, the hurt on his face. But that's, that's, that's where, I, where I, I came from. But he wanted, he wanted me and my brothers to be men, so he, he, would, he would teach us, and he would talk to us, and he'd raise us. I never, I never heard a cross word from my grandfather's uh, voice. I never heard him say anything detrimental to anybody. He was always a man that was, that was uplifting and wanted us to do things within the confines of what he understood. Now, you take into consideration that you have to share your bed with your wife, with the, plant, with, with the plantation owner, and still you maintain a sense of confidence and admiration and success and hope for your children. That was my grandfather. And everything that I've achieved, I would make sure, I make sure that he is granted some type of recognition for my being here. I'm sorry I cut you off which one, but I want Okay, what was his name? His name was... His name was Joe Lynch, okay. and we used to go to church, and he'd put, on the church dudes, he'd put a nickel in, that's, that's what we do, he'd put a nickel, that's what they put in, and he's one of the church deacons, 
and they would give us, he'd give me a, give us a penny. Now, I never put penny in church, I bought candy with it, okay? <laughs> uh, but, but I just wanted to give the recognition to him for... Yeah, I've never heard you talk about him, no. It's, it is too heartbreaking to talk about, but I wanted it to be, I wanted to do it here this day. Good. Now, um, what do you ask me? I forget. I, some, I was fast forwarding to the mid 60s where, and asking you what, to talk a little bit about what got your interest and in, what got you into, in, in your interest in politics, especially in the Glenville neighborhood, which is where it began for you. Well, when I was at, when I was at Bowen Wallace, we had a okay. Democratic and Republican club, and I was, I was president of the Young Democrats in Bowen Wallace, and I, I had an interest in that. But when we were in Memphis, you couldn't, you couldn't vote, okay? And, and when you, yeah, but you could vote, but you had to vote like Boss Crump says you could vote, okay? You had to vote the Crump ticket. And, but when I came here, became active in, in the Democratic Party College, and then I became active in, here in, 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 in Cleveland with the Democratic Club. We lived in Ward 27, as a man by the name of Bill Sweeney. Bill Sweeney was our insurance man. My brother Zeke and I, the insurance man. And so Bill, the superior is beginning to change from white to blacks. Blacks began to move in. And, and we knew Bill. And Bill said that he did not understand the problems of black people. Much different. All he wanted, he would call and make sure the streets were paved and things of that nature. But black folks wanted jobs and those kind of things. So he decided that he would not run again. He said, look, if you all want to run, you can take it. So my brother would say, look, George, you run, we'll, we'll go in. So we, I ran in 1963, okay? And that's the first time I was elected. And, and 65 was the first time that Carroll ran for mayor, and it was, he lost a, a close election. And in 67, I was not involved, I was in college at the time, but I know that 67 had a different feel to it, and, and Martin Luther King was deeply involved, and you were there the night, you were in at Carl's headquarters the night of election night in 67, I recall. <laughs> Dr. King was there, and what was your role in the 67 campaign? Well, go back to the 65 campaign when he won, when he ran, but he, he lost. And uh, I think there was about eight uh, black councilmen, and we did not support him. I know you were for Loker, correct? Is that his name? Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The mayor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not so much for him as, as we did not support Carl. And that's one of the few things in politics that I've always regretted it. But what happened. You had to know Carl. Carl was a man I that... I did. Okay, he didn't, he didn't suffer fools, and he was... Carl came, we had a meeting with Carl, Charlie Carr, Jimmy Bell, George White. We all had a meeting with him, and at the meeting, he said he's going to run for mayor, and Carl says, uh, I want you to support me. And, you, and, and then he said, you better support me. And if you know Carl, if you knew him, you know what his attitude would be. So now we were all elected from these small wards, and he said, no, you, you better support me. If you don't, I'll run against you. So none of us did except Jimmy Bell. Now, Jimmy swore that he wasn't going to support him, but Jimmy later came back and supported him. So we didn't support him, and he lost. And it's, it's, it's one of the few things that I have regretted not doing in, in, in the business of politics. Well, the next time, in 67, when he, he, he was writing, he came by and said, look, I need your, ho your help, I need your support, and we did. And I'm not saying that he won because we supported him, but we supported him because it was the right thing to do. It, it, I'm going to be a little gentle in the way I phrase this. There's the, history is all, there has been some dispute over the extent of Dr. King's influence in that race. And he, he spent a lot of time in Cleveland registering people to vote, et cetera. Could, could 1967 have turned out the way it did uh, 
had he not been so involved? Well, the, that campaign with, with Dr. King coming to Cleveland is, is something that I, I very seldom, no, I don't talk about. I don't, I don't <laughs> talk about the intricate parts of it. But no, we could not have won that election without him coming here. He, he, he went out into various neighborhoods on the back of 18-wheeler trucks with the uh, Operation Red Basket Band and registered black people all over the city of Cleveland. And it was those registrations that allowed enough people to be on the, on the roads that Congress got, got elected. There had been some controversy about things, but I, I, I've never spoken about them and will not speak about them. I'm going to get ahead of myself for that. We, we've talked a lot about Carl, and and within the past three or four years, uh, Carl died in '92 or '93, I believe. And, mm -hmm. and within the last two or three years, Arnold Pigney has passed away, and Lou Stokes has passed away, and I've been doing what I'm doing for 49 years, and there have been. What, forget about color, there have been four dominant political personalities in this town, and it is those three and yourself. And, you know, I know that you've talked and you've mentioned to a lot of people that you're the only one left and that, you know, that's something that, you know, it's human nature that, that you think about that once in a while. but. What is your collective legacy that the four of you and, and then also yourself have left this, left this town? No, what, what, I, what I said is that I now eat lunch with white people because all my black <laughs> friends are dead. Yeah, it's the only reason you call me, right? <laughs> well, the, the, the four of us all had distinct personalities. Okay, uh, let me wrap it up with Carl had a, he's the guy that started all of this. Yes. He's, you got, have to give him credit because he started all this, but he had a very strong, strong personality. And, and I remember, I remember when night was at the board of election, he and I had been arguing about something and uh, he came in and, <laughs> and he came up to shake my hand. I said, I'm not going to shake your hand. He said, you better shake my hand. I said, I'll knock you down. <laughs> so, so, I, so he had his son, Cardell. Cardell was here last night. Yeah. Cardell is about 10 feet tall, weighed yeah. 400 pounds. And Cardell, get him. <laughs> so in about 10 minutes, we shook hands and forgot about what was going on. But he started all this. He was the... The last black black politics in the country. Lou was completely different. Lou was Lou was the man that that put people together, wanted to make things work out, and 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 and, and he, he was really away from the grit of the local politics because he spent a lot of time in this thing, okay. He spent a lot of time in D.C., but he was a completely different personality. Wanted men, things, make people get together. And then there was Arnold. Arnold and I was very close. Arnold and I was, were friends. And, and a lot of times we talk about we had to put things together, make things work, school board, city hall, what have you, to put those together. Lou would stay in D.C., didn't have to be worried about that. But he and I were, was, was personal friends. But Arnold was a... Was a was a guy that organized things. He, that's what he took great pride in. He could organize and put folks together. And, and everybody liked, liked Arnold. Everybody liked everybody except me, okay? <laughs> but, he, but he and I was, was very close. And we, he made, he was head of the 21st District Caucus. And that was kind of the political machine of the black organization in the city of Cleveland. And he would make sure that Holes were covered, and these kind of things were done so we could be successful. Okay. You had been in city council for a decade, but uh, in 1973, and Carl had gone off to New York City, and you had made a name for yourself in council. You and Charlie Carr were probably the two 
most prominent black members of city council. I remember I was covering City Hall, I was 25 years old, and I got a call one night in 1973, I think it was in, in, in the summer, of got a call at home from Tony Garofoli, 8.30, 9 o'clock. He said, you gotta come downtown. I said, what are you, what's this all about? He said, I'll, I want you to come and meet me at Joe Verkan's bar, and this was a bar that I was, unfortunately I was familiar with, and it was in Jerry McFall's ward. And so I went down there and you had to buzz your way in and in there, Tony Garofoli and the owner of the bar and Jerry McFall. And they said, we're, we dragged you out of bed down here to give you a story. We're gonna have a new council president tomorrow. And they did and the council president was George. Um, and so we got, began this, this long run of 16, 17 years um, of council president. They, they found a way to get rid of the, the existing council president. They made him head of the Public Utilities Commission because he didn't really do an effective job of standing up to Mayor Perk. And your council presidency was without question uh, the most arguably effective and without question the most power you became the most powerful council president in history and is it something you had to learn or is it you you went you you were council president through two really really turbulent years uh, perhaps the most turbulent years uh, in, in the city's history and uh, how did you get through all that stuff and how did you learn to become so effective and powerful and use that power in, at times and often in ways that were designed to benefit the people, in the, to benefit your community? I, I always shy away from the term powerful. I, I, I really do because it, it, it denotes an arrogance on the part of the person it's referred to. Um, Influential? Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, okay influential. Important, okay. <laughs> but I guess it goes back to the, the ability to get along with people. And when you, when you, when you pick cotton and drive a mule and work in hotels, uh, long hours as a kid, you, you look for a better, better way of life. And when an opportunity like being a Cleveland City Councilman presents itself, you, 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 you take advantage of that. But you also know where you came from, and it, and it humbles you. Now, I know that sounds strange coming from me, but I was always aware of who I was, where I came from, and who I represented. Now, when I, when that was, I, I was always mindful, I never forgot this, that I was a black man who was the president of a majority white council. I never forgot that because when I first was elected, it was 33 of us, and I think it was 13 blacks. And 20 would always be 13. So I always had to scheme to figure out how can I get enough votes to make sure that I have 17 who could do this. And you had to get along with my, I along with my council. And that was, that was not seen. But what was publicized was that here's this black guy's wheel and all this, this nonsense. I knew how to get along with, my mama told me how to get along with people, okay? I was in the Marine Corps, you had to survive. And I was always aware of how do I make this thing work? So in order to, in order to put it together, I always had to go to the other side and make sure that we were all together. Now, I could not have lasted, how long was, it up? was I there? 20? From, from 73 through, till 1990. Okay, you couldn't have, always a majority white council always a white mayor and you could not have survived and you could not have stayed there unless you knew how to get along with people now what you all wrote was one thing but what i did was something else okay 
talk for a minute about the Kucinich years because there was no, to repeat myself, there's never been 24 months like it. I, I, the phrase you used when you talked about him at the time was you accused him of playing polka dot politics, I believe was the term. And things were really messy. They were, it was, was not a fun time to be in. And, and, and you had to, you personally, took some tough positions that slowed the administration down from doing what it wanted to do in cer certain areas. And it was a turbulent time. And, and, as, and as brilliant as you all say I was, okay, and as smart as I was, I was stupid enough to put an election on a Sunday. I'm aware of, I've reminded you of that. For Dennis, okay. I'm, in August of 1978. We're going to run him out of town. So there I was a election. recall election of the mayor of Cleveland, and <laughs> George had this idea that, tell me if I'm wrong here, that we're going to have the, a recall election on a Sunday, and... When the white, when black, black folks left church, they, they would go, go from right from home. church to the polling place. Instead, they went from church and to fried home. chicken and cooked greens. Right. <laughs> and okay. the, you had this election, a recall election against Dennis Kucinich, where he survived by 120,000 people voted, and he survived by 236 votes. Um, but it was a difficult time, I mean, yeah. yeah. And now he's your good friend, correct? He called me yesterday. He, he did, okay. He, he, he called me yesterday, and he, he, he said that he was in Europe and that he was sending a letter that he would like for it to be read. So I, did. And I yeah. told the lady that, you know, I, I would not be opposed to, to read. Now, I called him a racist. He wasn't a racist. He was, he was a populist. And, but he was shrewd and he was smart. And I think he and I dealt with the same kind of, kind of policies. Dennis knew how to take the people that he represented and make sure that they were always taken care of. And he would project me as a guy that was opposed to him. And I did the very same thing with him, okay? I want to make sure that black folks were taken care of, but in order to make sure that my flanks were protected, I made him a racist. And he really wasn't. When he ran for, when he ran for president, the national media all came to see me and talked to me and said, well, this guy's a racist. I said, well, he's not a racist. They said, well, you said he was. I said, I know that, but he's not a racist. <laughs> You know, and he never forgot that, that at least I, 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 I cleared up that. But Dennis was immature. He was too young to be the mayor of the city. That's what it was. He was too young to be the mayor of the city of Cleveland. He didn't take things and, and put it in position and perspective that it should be. And it was consequently he's bad for the city. Now what happened, because Dennis was so bad, white folks came to me and said, George, save us. That's correct. <laughs> True story. You, be, you were their go-to guy. Okay, save us, George. I said, okay, I'm gonna save you, right? <laughs> True story. Uh, huh? Absolutely. And but, and then in the last ten years of, of your of your service as council president were spent with the mayor, who was 180 degrees different than Dennis, and 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 and, and, and George Voinovich was the mayor with whom you probably got along the best over the, the, the entire course of his time as mayor. And you were widely accused, and I know this bothers you, you were widely accused at the time of running the city. And if it bothered Voinovich, he always did a good job of not showing it, but... But it, it didn't but bother him. It, it did not bother him. It, it did not but bother But it did bother you a little yes, bit. Yes, it did, because it was untrue. Okay, but it did not bother But you him. did have some influence, let's not kid ourselves. I mean, you had more in influence, that's my new word, not power. You, you had more influence than a lot of council presidents would have had uh, under, in, in given the circumstances. You had a good, a good relationship with him. 
he knew that he was a Republican, okay? And it was, a, it was a, an all-democratic council, except that one time it was Paul Hagan, a couple more people. Ralph Perk Jr. Okay. And, but he and I got along. We, we talked. And when the word would come out that George runs the seat of Cleveland and Forbes, this was it. I, I remember one day I went over, he and I, Merce went over and I had a conversation. I said, this, this bothers me. It's not true. I'm not trying to do this. He said, I know that. Don't worry about it. What I need you to do is pass the legislation so we can get these things done in, throughout the city of Cleveland. And that was his attitude. And we got along very well. But I wasn't, I didn't, foolish enough to think that I was the most powerful man in the city of Cleveland. Untrue. Um. So it, you alluded to this. You made a lot of friends in corporate, in the corporate community, and civic leaders. Okay, during the Kucinich years, and some of those people, as when Voinovich decided that he wasn't gonna, didn't want to be mayor anymore, he was going to become governor. They, long story short, they convinced you to run. Um, didn't take too much convincing. Is it because you wanted to be mayor or you wanted to get out of council or a combination of both? It was time, time to move on. It was, it, was, it was time for me to leave council. I, I, never, I never thought about running for mayor. That never crossed my mind until it was time to leave City Hall. Merce was, Merce was leaving, it was retiring, and she had kind of kept things together. But I had done what... Uh, 26 years in, in City Hall, and it was, I didn't want to do that anymore. So when George C. was going to leave, I said, well, maybe I'll give it a shot. But they, we did a poll. We did a poll. And it fell out of D.C. to come do the poll. The poll showed that I was the most popular person in the state of Ohio, okay? that I was more, I was well known, nobody knew, I was more well known than anybody in the state of Ohio. But the poll also showed that I was the most hated person. <laughs> and that, that should have been the signal to me, that you can't do that. But then I decided to, but, but there was another factor. I was, that's when I was doing WRE, I had been doing... That was uh, earlier, but yes, yeah, but I, people didn't forget. Yeah, I'd done a night program on WRE, uh, talk show host. Talked about white, white folks all night long, okay? <laughs> and then black folks come in and call me and encourage you, George, that's right, straighten them out, right? So, that damage had been done on that radio program, and it, it could not have been undone. And I wasn't upset about it once the election was over. It was, it was you know, I, I got my just to. But then you stayed involved because almost immediately after you left office, you became, you were elected to head the, end, the local chapter of the NAACP, which you, I don't even know how long, at least a decade? 20 years. 20 years. Yeah. Um, And that kept you, that kept your name at the forefront, and then it enabled you to, in some ways, it was a perfect fit for you because it's something that you would always, you were always, it was at the forefront of your thinking when you were at city council. And do you, where does that fit in with your life, with the pieces of your life? The NAACP? Yes. It was, it was kind of an extension. They came to me and asked me would I, would I run. And it, it wasn't something that I was seeking, but it, it was something that was needed uh, in order to protect the interests of black people in business, uh, in, in the corporate community, and just plain civil rights. And it was, it was something that I had done all the time, but it, 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 was, a, it was a perfect fit and they didn't have any money and we, we raised a lot of money to make sure that the, the, the branch was financially stable and it, it was an extension of, of what I had been doing when I was at City Hall. I enjoyed it but then after 20 years I got tired of that. It was, it was time to leave. 
let me, let me, you know, go ahead. Because a lot of people don't know who I am and where I am. And there's my, my daughters and my <laughs> wife, and they're on the front. Kids made all right, but Mary called hell sometime, but she was, you've been married, what, 60, how many years? 64. Is that right? Mary, 64 years. Oh, that's 61, 64, same difference. <laughs> 61 years, okay. Right there by me. I, I, I think I said last night, when we, I was in college in Baldwin Wallace, I was going to school. And I met her, and I told her, she had, was at a social fair, a dance, she had on a red dress. <laughs> Nothing excited a black man like a red dress. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna get that girl. <laughs> yeah. Three great kids and three grandkids, three great grandkids, and that's kind of what my life. When I, when I used to tell people that you were a Sunday school teacher, they thought I was drunk, and, 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 and they they just refused to believe me. <laughs> but you did it for cripes a long, a long time. Twenty one right? years. Twenty one years. It kept my, it kept me together, okay? It, 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 it kind of kept me grounded. Well, there was this side of you that people never saw that, I mean, if you're with somebody for on and off for a half a century, you tend to figure things out. Do you regret not showing your, the, the, sometimes the, in public, the other, the other side of, of George Forbes? Let me, let me say this to you. There's nothing in the world worse than an arrogant politician, okay? Mm -hmm. Who thinks he knows everything, he or she knows everything, got all the answers just because they've been elected. And I tried not to assume that position. My church kept me grounded. I, I was raised in the church, my mother raised me in the church, my grandfather, it kept me grounded. And I always went to church, except when I, when I finished high school, and. I, I left home with Chicago, and I, I didn't go to church. And then when I went back home, came to Cleveland, I, I go to church every Sunday. And it, it keeps you grounded. It lets you know that it ain't, it ain't about you, man. It's about people. And I taught Sunday school for 21 years, every Sunday. And that develops the man. You ask me. Why did I do things with my values? All of that plays into who you are and, and, and what you can do. I'm amazed and surprised that people come up to me and, and last night said, well, we appreciate what you did and what you did for us. And, and I did it because it had, it, it was, I was supposed to do that. Well, then the, I've asked you this more than once in the past and it's a perfect way to wrap this up. Is, I'm gonna ask it again. How do you want to be remembered? <laughs> last night, last night is good enough. It's a great answer. Okay, last night is good enough. But you know, that's it. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you.